Hey there booktube, welcome back to my channel and welcome to A Closer Book. This is a series where I talk about three of my recent reads and today we are up to books 76 to 78. First up is Exit West by Mohsin Hamid. This is one of the books that was nominated for this year's Booker Prize and spoiler alert, it didn't win. In some unnamed eastern city, a young woman dons a black cloak to hide herself but she succeeds only in attracting the attention of a man. Nadia and Saeed, because those are their names, they meet as students in a night school seeking higher education. But when civil war breaks out, they find themselves unwilling pupils in a different kind of institution. At first, Nadia doesn't want to be tied down in any kind of relationship, not with her family and certainly not with Saeed. But as tragedy strikes close to home and it becomes increasingly more dangerous for her as an unmarried woman to exist and to live on her own, she moves in with Saeed and his family. And this is only the first of many moves, the couple finding themselves having to leave the already unfamiliar landscape of their homeland and seeking refuge in other countries. They move around the world, they leave their country and move around the world through these magical doors that take them first to one city and then to another and they find themselves a part of a group of refugees who probably left home looking to kind of disappear in an established society but end up changing the landscape by their very presence. At first, Exit West appears to be a story of a couple, but it is at once a political commentary on war and peace and everything in between. Hamid captures the feeling of the migrant who has a fear of the future even as he's running towards it. And also the complexity of these claustrophobic relationships that people put themselves in looking not so much for those people that they're in relationships with but for the version of themselves that they imagine or remember themselves being in those relationships. The story is a discussion of war and the effect that it has on the people who fight, on the people who are being fought, on the people who are being fought over or fought about. Blaming none absolutely but offering, if you will, an insight on the inner workings of the mind of the person who gets caught up in this struggle willingly or unwillingly. And while Hamid interprets a challenging situation and goes so far as to suggest solutions to a global concept of immigration and a refugee crisis, this is by no means a perfect story or even a good attempt at one. There are pages of prose that ramble, but do it with such beautifully expressed words that you kind of don't care that he isn't saying much because he's saying it so well. There are chapters that could have been said more expressly, like the ones where the characters are just waiting around, waiting for things to happen or waiting for themselves to change. So the reader is forced to watch these two people morph in print and it becomes an activity kind of like watching a time-lapse video on its original speed. You're like, can we speed this up? <laughs> And as the couple moves relatively easily across the geographical landscape, as though these barriers that prevent entry or prevent escape do not exist, so Hamid's commentary moves easily from the problems that exist in one part of the world to the other, as though East and West no longer exist since they become only relative markers for the characters to move around in. In this, the author's attempt felt a little overambitious, like he had this really great plan, but he didn't really execute it, because even while he is acting as though these geographical barriers no longer exist, he pits these people from these geographical locations against each other against their own people and against all the other people who are refugees. Then we got to the quandary. How do I like the book? And how do I like the book as a contender for the Man Booker Prize? Because the answers are not one and the same. I appreciated the novel. Would go so far as to say I loved aspects of the novel and have only a few critiques. Exit West is a well-told story about an important subject that is personally interesting to me. But it's not as complex as I think a Booker Prize winning novel would be. The Booker Prize has already been awarded to someone else, so we know he didn't win. But for it to have even been considered and been shortlisted for the prize, I think the book was not quite up to that level. So I regard it as complex and moving, but not as intellectually deep as I would want it to be for a Booker nominated book booker nominated book as a love story it is one where hope lives and dies and is reborn again in a different form but i didn't like the ending and so yeah that's exit west exit west exit west
Book number 77 is still here by Lara Vapnir, and it is a story of four Russian immigrants who were friends in Russia and have now moved to New York City, and their relationships resemble those of incestuous siblings. They're all friends, they're all best friends, but they've all had non-platonic relationships with each other. All the male-female combinations have dated each other at some point, and even in the description of the same gender relationships, there are vague undertones of homoeroticism. So here are the characters. Vika and Sergei are married to each other, but at one time, Sergei was dating Regina. Vadik and Sergei are best friends, but he and Vika have had at least one romantic encounter, and it is a strong possibility that Vika and Sergei's son is actually Vadik's biological child. Regina and Vadik are platonic friends, but only barely. Still here? Okay. Sergei has developed an app and is hoping to sell it to Bob, who is Regina's American husband and the only non-Russian character in the novel. Which means that Sergei obsesses about Bob like a schoolgirl obsesses about getting a date from a high school quarterback. He talks about him, he does everything to make Bob like him. But then, Bob is also kind of obsessed with Sergei's wife and makes passes at her, but only when he's drunk so he can blame it on the alcohol. Everyone in this book is tied up in some kind of an incestual love triangle and it's weird. But you're still here, right? <laughs> Good, because that's the title of the novel and here's the reason for it. So Sergei's app is about continuing a person's online presence after the person has died. So the app is to collect piecemeal information from a person's online activity and when the person dies, putting that code together so the person can still comment on your Facebook page or send you tweets, or send you messages based on what their online characteristics were when they were still alive. Sergei is obsessed with the idea of immortality, but so are all the other characters. And as we read their backstories, as we read the things that they have experienced, we understand why. They've all dealt with loss, but Sergei in particular is obsessed with this Russian philosopher called Fyodorov, who he says is the one who invented cloning as, an, as, the, as the way to continue a person's life even after death. So he becomes obsessed with the idea of resurrecting his father who he thinks died prematurely and realizing that his own son doesn't have the same need for him that he had for his father and so feeling like even though he's creating this app he's failing in his own personal relationships because after he's dead his son won't want to resurrect him. It's a really interesting look at the idea of mortality and even before mortality, what life means, what relationships mean, and how people are affected by their childhood and the things they read and how those things are expressed in the rest of their interactions. Vabnir arrives from this alternating third-person perspective. So she first introduces the friends as kind of a unit, but then follows them individually to explain their perspective on death all the family members that they have lost and their own fears as they grapple with the idea of their own immortality. While the novel is told in these alternating third-person perspectives and we're able to follow each character through the twists and turns of their lives and to see the good and bad of each character, it is still possible to cast characters in protagonist and antagonist and villain and hero roles. Sergei as protagonist and flawed hero for desiring to save himself and humanity from the silence of death. Vadik as antagonist because he suggests that Sergei is wasting his life by trying to resurrect someone else's. Vika as damsel in distress and also heroine for desiring to sacrifice herself for her husband. And Regina as a symbolic character who epitomizes the complexity of the immigrant experience because you find yourself in this country wanting to cling to this new life but also feeling pulled back to the responsibilities of helping the people in your former country. So the novel addresses the idea of immigration and immortality, and the author uses science really well. She broaches big topics like mortality and science to show the struggle that man has in adapting to his environment, but also trying to change it. She explores relationships and the limits of family and friendship and what we get from them. But the weakness of the novel, I think, comes in the author painting herself kind of into a, into a corner where none of the characters can help the other, but also because we are so intimate with them, they have exposed themselves in a way that this reader, at least, found that she empathized with no one after a while. 
there were plot points that weren't addressed at the end of the story. And so while this was an ambitious undertaking and a very good subject matter to discuss, I did learn a few things, but overall I wasn't wowed by this one either. So the big question at the end of the novel is, are you still here with these characters? Would you want to resurrect these characters? And because none of them truly dazzled me or endeared themselves to me, I'd have to say no, not so much. Book number 78 is a memoir by a retired war correspondent turned diplomat named Linda Schuster and the title of her memoir is Dirty Wars and Polished Silver. So most of the book, because of the font you can tell, most of the book is going to be about those dirty wars but this fine refined font at the bottom which seems like a little bit of an addendum is her life as this diplomat later. As a young Jewish girl growing up in the Midwest, Linda is taught about life from very different people. One person, one of her teachers is her mother, her what she calls unambitious mother, who becomes a housewife even though she had so much potential. The other is her overambitious father who flees the family instead of getting tangled up with domestic life. He flees for some bigger life, some bigger dream that he has. And then there is Linda's grandmother who keeps comparing her to her father and saying, you're just like him. And so these, this combination, this war of emotions that she is struggling with, forces Linda away from home really early. She runs away to a kibbutz at age 17 and she continues chasing wars around the world because she can't get people to really pay her the attention for the internal struggles that she is having. So she decides to write about wars around the world that people want to hear about. Pretty good, I think, right? <laughs> So it becomes a memoir of a young girl who would travel the world, chase danger while narrowly escaping the ravages of it, find love, lose it, find it again, run away from a past but realize that she was always running towards it, to work at exactly what she dreamed of but then realizing that the dream changes as you grow and change. Finally, to trade in her press pass for a diplomatic passport and embrace the one thing that she spent her whole life fighting against. As the title suggests, Linda's life doesn't follow a single, clear, defined path, but we read about the mile markers in her life, and some of them are pretty interesting mile markers, if I may say so. But the beauty of the book is that while Linda's life's work is in objective journalism, her storytelling abilities are not limited to unaffected writing. So this skill appears here in these hauntingly beautiful sentences that read like prose to relate a personal tragedy with a hybrid of disconnected emotion, if such a thing exists. And whether you agree or disagree with Linda's life choices, it makes for a pretty interesting read. So that's it. That's a closer book at these three recent reads. Go ahead and leave me a comment down below if you've read any of these and want to talk a little bit more about them. Or let me know what you're reading right now. So thanks for watching this video. And we'll talk in the comments. And until next time, happy reading. Bye.